light in the darkness oh my god that is who you are come and open your bibles with me to the book of joshua and chapter 17 joshua chapter 17 I'm going to read a few passages of Scripture here, verses 12 to 18, but Joshua chapter 17. If you didn't bring your Bibles with you, I want you to use your smart device. If we got Pro Presenter working, we might be able to throw that Scripture up there, Joshua chapter 17, verses 12 to 18. I want you to read with me. I'm reading from the New Living Translation. The Word of God tells us, but the descendants of Manasseh. Now, you might have grown up in the church, and we called it Manasseh. It's not pronounced Manasseh, it's Manasseh. Everyone say Manasseh. Ephraim and Manasseh. Don't you feel very Hebrew, very intelligent at the moment, like you've gone to the next level? I feel it right now. Manasseh. But the descendants of Manasseh were unable to occupy these towns because the Canaanites were determined to stay in that region. Later, however, when the Israelites became strong enough, they forced the Canaanites to work as slaves. But they did not drive them out of the land. The descendants of Joseph, Manasseh, came to Joshua and asked, Why have you given us only one portion of land as our homeland when the Lord has blessed us with so many people? Joshua replied, if there are so many of you, and if the hill country of Ephraim is not large enough for you, clear out the land for yourselves in the forest where the Perizzites and Raphaites live. The descendants of Joseph responded, it's true that the hill country is not large enough for us, but all the Canaanites in the lowlands have iron chariots both those in Bethshan and its surrounding settlements and those in the valley of Jezreel. They are too strong for us. Then Joshua said to the tribes of Ephraim and Manasseh, the descendants of Joseph, since you are so large and strong, you will be given more than one portion. The forests of the hill country will be yours as well. Clear as much of the land as you wish and take possession of its farthest corners. And you will drive out the Canaanites from the valleys too, even though they are strong and have iron chariots. Father, in the name of Jesus, we're asking right now that you would unlock the word. Father, I pray for your spirit to anoint me, Lord, this morning to be able to share this message with your sons and daughters. Lord, I pray that you would quicken the word inside of them. I pray that you would unlock doors that have been locked for years. I pray, Father God, that this will be a time of leveling up in the name of Jesus, all God's people said. Uh, I don't know if you know a little bit of the, the American kind of slang, you know, owned. You know what that word is? Owned. It isn't like the old-fashioned, I, I own that. I own that house. It's mine. It's not like that. When we use it today, it's a different vernacular when you say owned, okay? It's a slang word that, uh, I don't know if you know this one, it, it actually originated in the 1990s among hackers. So the hackers, what they would do is they'd try and hack into the computer system to root that system, that's where the word own comes from, where you gain administrative control over someone else's computer. And that term eventually became a gamer's term who used the term to indicate that they defeated someone. I own you. Okay, we use a little bit more vernacular than that today, but I own you is what we try and say. So I decided I'm going to look up the top five hacks. And here's number three of the top five. And you probably, if you were alive in 1999, you were there and you were aware of this. How many people heard of the Melissa virus? Melissa virus. There's a few, a lot of people like, I'm not going to put my hand up. They know my age. We already know. Just put your hand. Okay, Melissa virus. So here's very interesting. So the Melissa virus was created by a New Jersey programmer in 1999. His name was David L. Smith. And what he did is he disguised the virus in a simple Microsoft Word document. And so what happens is you end up, as an unsuspecting recipient, opening up that Word document because it looks legit, right? It comes from a workmate. And so remember, what happens is the moment you open it, 
It sends the same virus to the first 50 people in your address book. The first 50 people. Now, it looks legit because it's actually a legit address. It's an email address from a friend or from a workmate. So, of course, you open it up. By the time this thing was at its peak, it had infected 20% of the world's computers. That's a lot of computers. You're talking about billions and billions of computers. So we're talking about hundreds of millions, maybe, bil- you know, maybe a billion computer alone. Massive amounts to the point that Intel and Microsoft had to force a shutdown of all their outgoing mail servers until the problem could be solved. But today, we use that terminology to say, I own you. So you're playing tennis, you know, I'm praying with David Roke, you know, I pray with my son-in-law, Isaac. And Isaac's that next generation. He's still got that cockiness there. I'm going to take you down, dad-in-law. I'm going to take you down, you old men. And so we're on there. And then this is the thing after we, you know, securely beat him, you know, that serve comes in there and he can't reach it. I own you. He's over in the sound desk. They're watching me. I own you. <laughs> oh, that's right. He's controlling the sound. That's very good, right? But here's the thing. God is saying to the people of Israel, I'm giving you the land. You can have a present, and it's, given it, it's been given to you, but you don't take ownership of it until you actually take it. God is saying that the descendants of Manasseh were actually disobedient to God. God is saying to them, I want you to take hold of the things that I have promised you. What I've given you is enough. And I want you to destroy the inhabitants of the land because they are wicked in my sight. And God says, you need a fresh start. They cannot be allowed to remain in that land. But they did not carry out the instruction of God. They did not own it. If you're wondering what the title of the message is, it's own it. Exclamation mark. There's a problem, though, when the Bible says that they could not occupy. The Bible says in verse 12, the descendants of Manasseh were unable to occupy these towns because the Canaanites were determined to stay in that region. Have you ever had a problem in your life that simply won't go away? And you are battling with it day after day after day. You don't have to be an old person to have the same problem. It might be that hidden sin that no one knows about and you're still dealing with, but it owns you. And this is a question. Unless you are able to defeat your sin, unless you're able to defeat your own mind that tells you you can't do it, it owns you. And the Bible is telling us that God has given us authority to own it. But you have to remove the enemy. Perhaps some of you, you you can't quite relate to this. For you, it might be depression in your life. You've allowed it to conquer you. It owns you. You don't own it. Because it comes on you, and you're a victim. You're splayed out, and you simply can't help yourself. Perhaps it's anxiety, this anxiousness, and you can't breathe in air because the crushing force of the, the, uh, the being forced to do something you don't want to do, and it just keeps you limp, and there's nothing you can do to change that. Perhaps, yes, indeed, it's a secret sin no one knows about. It's an addiction, perhaps, that's in your life. Perhaps it's even compromise, You can't level up in your walk with God because you want to hang on to the things that are sinful and you know it, but you think to yourself, it's okay though because it's not that bad. Can I give you some news right now? All sin is sin in the eyes of the living God. I know you won't hear this in most churches preached, but I'm going to preach it anyway because it's the Bible. It's telling you, the Bible says, if you break one commandment, you broke them all. But within ourselves, somehow we have okayed it. We think, you know, it's just a little sin. It's just a little bit. You know, it doesn't hurt anyone. That's what the world says, right? As long as it doesn't hurt anyone. It hurts God. The Bible says it really clearly. There are problems. There are addictions. There are hidden sins that refuse to budge in your life. But will you let them remain? 
we were praying this morning around about, and uh, I wanted to stir something up. So if you want to pray, you don't normally go to a prayer group, come here at seven, uh, sorry, 845. We pray for half an hour. And this morning, I wanted to teach them how to hear from the Holy Spirit. How to, how to listen, how to see pictures, and how to be able to speak it up. And it was amazing how each one had their own version, and yet it was saying the same thing. That there is a choice that every son and daughter of the king needs to make. My wife said this really clearly past the T. She's saying, you are an heir of the kingdom, and you, and you hold heirs about yourself. That's where that word comes from. You have heirs about yourself. You should be. The devil should be shrieking in terror every time you walk into him. Oh, here he goes again. Quick, call out the minions. We're in trouble now. But we don't think like that. We think like we're the victims here and that we're always in trouble. It's the same thing with the sin. I couldn't help it. All I did was this, and it just fell in my lap. I couldn't help myself. Don't we normally talk like that? I can't help it. So, you know, I really try, Pastor. I really try. But I want to give you four key points. Here's, that's the first one. Realize you can't own it. A lot of people don't realize that. They think, no, 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 it's beyond me. I have been diagnosed. Uh, it's a sin that I've tried. I've been dealing with it for 40 years now. I can't seem to conquer it. It's not my fault. Own it. Because God is saying, I've made you more than overcomers. There is nothing that could keep you bound. And here's the thing. If you want to level up in the Lord, I want to challenge you with this thought. Jesus is expecting each of us to be bearing fruit in our lives. You are supposed to. In fact, this week I've been reading Corinthians and teaching this to my class at the same time. is very interesting. Paul says, by now, you ought to be teachers. Would you like to know how old those Christians were? Thank you for asking, sister. I'm going to tell you. Three years. That's it. From the time that they were saved to the time that they've been three years in the faith, in the early church, that was enough for you to qualify as a mature Christian, and you should be discipling someone. In fact, they would send people out to plant churches. Three years. Let me ask you that question. How long have you been a Christian for? Mm. This is the thing. Oh, but pastor, I don't want to level up because with the new level comes a new devil. That's what we say. That's right. But what you don't understand and appreciate is you are stronger then than you were before, and you can take the new devil on. It's actually a term of endearment in some ways because God is saying, okay, you are stronger now, so I will give you a stronger enemy. Some of us, we cower if you're, oh, God, I can't do this. No, no. You are so tough that God had to increase the enemy in your life because you become stronger through it. No pain. Everyone knows this. And yet when the hardship comes, we're trying to run. And God says, no, no. I left the enemy there in that territory. I wouldn't destroy them all because they're there for you to strengthen yourself and recognize how strong you really are. Because if you can't get a workout, you can't build any muscles. So I'm going to put the enemy in your life so that you have an opportunity to become stronger. Let me give you point number two. These are four key points to owning your enemy, owning your promises, leveling up. Number one was realize you can do it. Number two, don't cope with the enemy. Let me, let me explain. Verse 13 says, Later, however, when the Israelites became strong enough, they forced the Canaanites to work as slaves, but they did not drive them out of the land. In other words, they learned to cope with the enemy in their life. I don't know how you were brought up, but I, can, I dare say that many of us grew up in dysfunctional homes. I did. My dad was a bishop. My mother served as a pastor alongside him. There were pastors all in our house, our uncles and aunties and cousins. They're all pastors and leaders in the church. But let me tell you, my dad never spent time with me, ever, because he was too busy in ministry. Tell me that's not dysfunctional. My dad never told me he loved me. Tell me that's not dysfunctional. I can remember one hug in my entire life from my father. Grade three, he came to visit us in Australia because he sent us away. Too busy with ministry. Tell me that's not dysfunctional. 
I, don't, I didn't know what it was like to be a father. I didn't know what it was like to have a father. And some of you can probably relate to this. You might not have a mother. You might have some other struggles. You might have a father and mother in the home, but they've abdicated their right to be a father and mother, and so you're left to your own devices. You're grown up dysfunctional, and you don't even know it. We put up with all kinds of dysfunctions in our life. There are sins that are passed on to the fathers, to the sons, and the sons, to the grandsons, and we're not even aware of it because it's dysfunction that we're so used to. That's what we're talking about, coping with the enemy. It's an enemy in your life that is out to try and destroy you. If for nothing less, the enemy simply wants you not to grow, not to level up, because the enemy fears you. I'm not just talking about the devil here. I'm talking about the addictions in your life. I'm talking about those emotions in your life that overcome you in waves and you simply give in to it. For some of you, your anger is a problem. By the way, anger is often rooted in depression. But you are angry all the time and you can't figure out why and you can't level up. You can't do it because it has control over you. It owns you. Because they did not get rid of their enemies, they had to learn to live with their bad decisions. Another word for bad decisions is called soft choices. It's a choice that you have now on this side of the timeline. And people have been warning you, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it. You know what the Word of God says, don't do it. You know, and still you think to yourself, you know what? No one will notice. I'm going to follow my heart. You ever heard that? The Bible says the heart is deceitful above all things. Guard it with everything. Guard your heart above all else, for out of it flow the issues of life. And yet we say, follow your heart. Follow your heart. Your heart lies to you. It will cause you to sin against God. And the only rule we can do, we can follow, is the Word of God. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever made a bad decision that you have had to pay the price for? Some of you live in regret today. Some of you are still living with that bad decision, and you just say, I guess it's my life. I guess this is just the way it's going to be. That's just the way it is. And you still pay the price, and you live a miserable life, and you can never level up. It's an incredible thing about humans is that we have the ability to normalize pain. We live with it with such pain that eventually we try and work our way around it. We normalize addiction. It's okay. You know, I'm not hurting anyone. It's, you know, it's just normal. It's okay. Abuse, we normalize abuse and think it's okay. And we try, yep, it's just the way it is. It's the way we grew up. It's not okay. I remember a young man in the 90s. Let's just call him Tommy because I don't, you don't know him, but just to make sure you don't, Tommy. Tommy's a young man, skinny, blonde, good-looking guy. He came to our church, and we had a whole bunch of, and he was a muso, played electric guitar. He was pretty good. He was going to get better. And so we used to hang out together, all the musos and the young adults would hang out. We'd go out here, we'd go out there, and he wanted to really be part of our team. He wanted to be part of the worship team. He wanted to be part of the young adults. He just wanted to hang out with us. And so uh, Tommy came along with us everywhere we went. And he was progressing well in the church. He seemed to be growing in the Lord. He seemed to be making the right decisions until we found out that he had compromised himself with a woman. She was about 18 years his senior. She wanted to be a young adult. Complete opposite of this guy. Here's this good-looking, tall, skinny guy. Here's a woman that's seen better years, you know. There's things hanging off everywhere. But the thing was, she showed him love. He had this problem in his heart where he was rejected. He never grew up with a father. His mother was always too busy for him, and he was finally getting some attention. And some attention is better than no attention. And so he took it, and he thought it was mature love between a man and a woman, not realizing it wasn't. It was immature love. It was puppy love. He just wanted to know that I'm a person. 
that I can be appreciated. But because he, he felt this love, he went right for it. And then he got found out. In his remorse and in his guilt, he wanted to hide it and, and just to hide that sin. And he decided, I'm going to marry her. And he announced this, I'm going to marry her. 19-year-old kid, 19 plus 18 is 37-year-old woman. I think she was 38. It was a match made in hell. It just could not possibly work out. Lovely people of their own, but it was never going to work out. And we warned him. We told him, don't do it. But he made the softest. I'm making the right decision. I want to make it good. You don't have to. Tommy, just repent before God. Ask your forgiveness from this person, but don't do it. In your heart of hearts, pray about it. Don't do it. He did it. Marriage didn't last six months, and his life has never been right again. He's walked away from the church. She's not in the church. And God knows what's happened to them today. What are you accepting knowing it is not God's best for your life? We call them soft choices. Everyone okay? Here's the third one. Don't blame others. In verse 14, the descendants of Joseph came to Joshua and asked, Why have you given us only one portion of land as our homeland when the Lord has blessed us with so many people? Notice that although they failed to conquer their entire territory, they chose to accuse the one who gave them the inheritance. They're blaming him instead because of their failure. It's a way that we do this in life. We do this all the time. They were supposed to conquer the entire land. Remember that Joshua, God said to him, Joshua, you're getting old. And I want you to divide the territory. And now it's up to the 12 tribes of Israel to take down their enemies, to claim it, to own the land. It is yours. It is promised that I am fighting for you. And yet these guys failed to conquer their enemy. And now they're complaining, you didn't give us enough land. Have you ever questioned God, wondering why he hasn't given you more? God, I deserve more. You know what I've done for you? Why aren't things better? I deserve better than this, Lord. It's that kind of thinking that ends up shipwrecking many Christians in their walk with God. God, what you did to her is unfair. That is cruel. You did this to her. Did God do that to her? <laughs> In college, we go through all kinds of stupid things in, Ameri in American colleges. You live on campus. You live in dormitories. I grew up in dorms and boarding school, so I was used to it. And it's the pranks that I really hated. Where one kid, he did, well, adult, takes Limburger cheese, okay? It's a really, really stinky cheese. And he wiped it on the nose of a sleeping student. It was so smelly the kid wakes, the student wakes up. He goes, oh, this room stinks. And so he goes, storms out of that room and goes into the, into the hall, into the hall where there's a mess hall. Everyone gets together. And he says, oh, this place stinks. And so he goes out of the dormitory. Oh, this college stinks. Well, the college didn't stink. It's that cheese on your nose that stinks. But he didn't think and didn't understand there was cheese on his nose that he had to wipe off and wash off before he could get that stink away from his nose. It wasn't the room. It wasn't the hall. It wasn't the campus. It was the cheese on his nose that he wasn't aware of. But how many of us are like that and we live our lives not recognizing the Lindberger cheese is on your nose? Turn to the person next to you and say, the cheese stinks. And so we blame other people because the cheese, the room stinks. Everything stinks. Get rid of the cheese on your nose and you'll find the stink is gone. Let me put it another way. The more you deal with your problem, the less likely you are to blame others. Thank you, Pastor. That was, that was just revelation. Ah, you're welcome. Number four. Key number four is the last one. Stop making excuses. Own it. The word says in verse 15, Joshua replied, If there are so many of you, 
And if the hill country of Ephraim is large enough for you, clear out the land for yourselves in the forest where the Perizzites and Raphaites live. Let me just summarize what he's saying. If the hill country isn't large enough, clear the forest. You get the idea of what he's trying to say? He's saying, look for the opportunity around you. So many times we find it hard to look for the opportunities because we are so focused on what we feel should be the opportunity that we're missing multiples of opportunities around us because those options are too hard. David Ring, I'm going to ask if the team can come up now, worship team. David Ring uh, is a well-known Christian evangelist and motivational speaker in the United States. He was born in 1953, and his mother was dying, and they thought he died. And so they cast little newborn baby David aside, and they focused on the mom for 18 minutes, resuscitating the mom, and she was okay. It wasn't until later they discovered that David was actually alive, but on the brink of death. Some say he actually died. Some of the doctors say he died for the 18 minutes and somehow came back to life. But he came back to life. But because of 18 minutes with the cord still wrapped around his neck, that boy ended up having cerebral palsy. And David grew up with a mockery of people his entire life because he couldn't walk properly. And he was mocked because of that in school. David was mocked because he couldn't speak properly. This is how he would speak. And so they mocked him because he couldn't walk and he couldn't talk. For years, he put up with that. And to add insult to injury, both his parents in the same year contracted cancer and they died when he was still only 14 years old and became a ward of the state. Just gets worse and worse. What a pathetic story. He can't talk. He can't walk. And now he doesn't even have parents, and he's a ward of the state. The thing about David is that he put his hope in the Lord. And he recognized, my battles are not my battles. They are the Lord's battles. The battle is the Lord's. And he would see every problem as a challenge, a challenge begging to be overcome. And he would make these kind of comments. He says, when I climb on the stage, I have something to overcome. And when I speak, I have something to overcome. I have cerebral palsy. What's your problem? We are constantly looking at what, we've got these things, I can't do it, it's, it's just too tough. You know, the hill country is too difficult. They've got iron chariots and we don't have iron chariots. But you've got the Lord. You've got the King of kings, the Lord of lords, says, I will take your battle as my own. I will send the hordes, the thousands upon thousands upon thousands of the Lord's army. We will defeat your enemy for you. Take responsibility for your decisions. Stop making excuses. The Lord wants to level you up, but until you own your enemy, it owns you. Why don't we stand to our feet as I begin to close this morning? I want to challenge you with this thought. Joshua had to twice tell the people in the short passages that we read. He says, I've already divvied out the land for you. You've got hill country there with forests. Clear out the forest, and there you go. There's more land. And they kept insisting, we deserve more. We deserve better. It's entitlement. We deserve better because we're bigger. And he said to them, no, clear out the land. He had to tell them twice, clear out the land. Now, I don't know what's happening in your life right now, the sin that might be in your life, that depression, that anxiety, the addictions that just threaten you to keep you under the thumb, and you are struggling with this. It's been a while. In fact, you have made excuses for it. It's become familiar to you, and you've learned to cope with it. You've never truly addressed it, and God's saying, now is the time to level up. Now is the time to own that addiction. Now is the time to own your enemy.